Hello and welcome. Um, my name is James Green, Content Director at Jane's, and it gives me uh, great pleasure to welcome you today to um, our briefing, which will examine defense technology innovation and the future of military capabilities. And it also gives me great pleasure to announce that today's speakers are Tate Nurkin, um, Executive Director at the Jane's uh, Strategic Assessment and Futures Studies Center, and also uh, to Stephen Rodriguez, uh, founder of One Defense. So just before I hand over to Tate, um, I should let you know that the Jane's Intelligence Briefing Program consists of around about 40 events uh, a year, and it's available to all of our Intelligence Center and module uh, customers. So uh, before I jump into the, the meat of this brief, very quickly, just a little background on where this uh, research comes from, because it does sit a little bit outside of our core products certainly draws on them, but does sit outside of them. Um, so as James mentioned, I run a group called the Strategic Assessments and Futures Studies Center, which uh, we started about four years ago. It's kind of an internal think tank to look at the future of big strategic competitions, security and threat, environment, uh, security and threat environments, military capabilities, and uh, operations. And what is uh, critical to our research, indeed the, the, the primary focus, is understanding how innovation in technology and competitive strategies, operational concepts, business models, et cetera, might disrupt these competitions and environments and military capability development pathways and to help uh, organizations understand and anticipate uh, when these shifts might happen and hopefully offer a different perspective and uh, hopefully compelling as well uh, that challenges some of the base assumptions we have about, uh, about these environments. So that's our objective today is to hopefully provide a, a, a different perspective on, on the future of defense capabilities and uh, defense technology and military capabilities. And we seek to do that really through five different uh, points in this brief. First, I want to talk about the defense technology and innovation environment. It's a very expansive and complex environment, and we want to talk about why and what that means. Uh, we also want to articulate a framework that we've developed in, our, in my group for assessing the future of defense technology and, and really to help bound what is a very uh, difficult and complicated topic. And then we'll talk about implications of what uh, what uh, innovation and technology environment means for different different actors. So we'll start with perspectives on defense technology, wonders at the threshold and the four revolutions. So I know we're on the phone and uh, on WebEx, but somehow I can still uh, sense that some are probably raising their eyebrows at that sort of uh, phrase, wonders at the threshold and wondering what it means and where it comes from. Well, it it comes from this guy, Charles H. Duell, who was the head of the U.S. Patent Office a long time ago, uh, at the beginning of the last century. And uh, he said in 1902 that, in my opinion, all previous advances in the various lines of invention will appear totally insignificant when compared with those which the present century will witness. I almost wish that I might live my life over again to see the wonders which are at the threshold. And I am a collector of quotes, and I like this one a lot, in large part because I think it very um, succinctly and eloquently summarizes the sentiment that I think every post-industrial uh, uh, revolution generation has, that there is some technology-driven shift, some big cataclysmic change that will make, in most cases, our lives easier or cooler or whatever that is just beyond uh, the horizon, that it's at the threshold. So now what I want to do is talk a little bit about why, what's driving this big innovation environment. And I'll start with kind of this expanding threat environment and mission requirements. In other words, national security and defense communities are being asked to do a lot more. And one way to deal with that challenge, which can be very expensive, is through technology. It's through finding ways to make platforms and systems do more or to enhance the effectiveness of the people that you have in the field. So speaking of technologies, um, we've put a list, this is a list of about, uh, well, 24, I guess, you know, uh, various categories of, of technology. Some are more specific uh, than others. It's, it's not meant to be inclusive. It's more meant to be indicative of the range of technologies and technology areas that militaries uh, and security communities throughout the world are writing about and talking about and investing in. So it's an expansive uh, innovation environment. It's also incredibly complex, right? Innovation isn't coming from just one place. It's multidimensional. Certainly there is incredible and impressive innovation coming from defense industrial bases and the military. 
Um, uh, but there is also relevant, increasingly relevant innovation in some of the technologies we just listed from the commercial and high-tech industry and from research and academia. And I know Stephen's going to go into a lot more detail. How does all this go wrong and what the hell do we do about it, um, to be candid? Um, there's a lot of stuff happening, uh, some of which is in insider control and a lot of which uh, is outsider control. First off, uh, you know, A2AD, insurgencies, hybrid warfare, these are not new. These have been around for a long time. They're just now tech-enabled and, and creatively employed. Uh, I'll give you a good example. Currently, uh, um, ISIS uh, in Mosul uh, was using uh, quadcopters, not just one, to videotape or provide a, a persistent surveillance, but the, putting up multiple quadcopters uh, to provide mesh networking and persistent comms that goes far and away beyond just, you know, getting a, a camera on, uh, you know, advancing Iraqi troops. Um, <clears throat> As a response, uh, we have had to develop effectively a, a rolling con ops where we suppress one, one block with uh, electronic warfare, uh, attack another block with cyber, cyber warfare, and uh, the third block we uh, take down with uh, kinetic action. This is uh, a completely different way of approaching what Tate might call, or what is, Tate has referred to as uh, core warfare, and we've been forced to rapidly adapt uh, in the face of uh, these, uh, as I said, uh, tech-enabled tech and creatively employed uh, adversaries. And uh, the bad news is they've had 40-plus years to study uh, uh, Western capabilities. Uh, as a case, a case in point with the U.S. military, um, <clears throat> most of our uh, major uh, uh, revolutions in military t technology were conceived in the 70s, deployed in the 80s, and battle-tested in the 90s. A great example, uh, the U.S. Army. The U.S. Army has something called the Big Five, which was, uh, let's see here, the Bradley, the Abrams, the Blackhawk, the MLRS, um, multiple launch rocket system, and the Apache, which all came out between 1979 and 1984. Um, <clears throat> meanwhile, uh, you know, our partners as well as our adversaries have been investing in capabilities that directly offset this military technology, you know, things that Tate's already talked a lot about. Here's the key. Their investments have drawn more on commercial technology than their own legacy industrial base. Uh, so how do we bridge, uh, bridge this gap? How do we cross the, the Rubicon between uh, the global defense market and the commercial ecosystem? Uh, not unlike crossing the, the river Styx and going from one domain, <laughs> one, one domain to the other. Um, <clears throat> uh, so first off, uh, and this, the, these last two slides really get into the tactics of you know, what do we do about all this? Um, so um, how, do you, how do you, if you're in the global defense industrial base, enable your customer base? One is by taking a leadership role uh, and lighting the path for your customers on commercial engagement. Currently, uh, that's, uh, that's being led by uh, government and academic research universities, uh, and it's still the case. Um, the challenge is, of course, when you're trying to play catch up, uh, and I'm sure many of you will appreciate this, you really have to avoid what we call innovation theater, and that's the, uh, the desire to, to, to be splashy, to appear maybe more innovative than you are, or maybe in that technology up, and productizing it in their own militaries two to three years faster than we are. With our, they're not even stealing it yeah. with our own government-funded R&D. So these are, uh, these are critical challenges. They are happening to us. Uh, whether we decide to do anything about it or not. Um, we look forward to uh, speaking to you uh, at future briefings. Thank you and goodbye. Mm -hmm.